God have given any direction at all to Christians concerning financing the church that Jesus built, that he shed his blood to purchase. Is it reasonable to think that the church and all that it does, as the New Testament teaches, has been left without any guidance at all concerning how, underscore the word how, to secure financial necessities. Such an assumption is really not logical at all for one who knows the New Testament teaching concerning the church and the great work it is to be doing on this earth. In a moment, I want us to look to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. But prior to that, I want us to do a little background work here and go back to the beginning of the church. Now, the inspired Luke tells us that the Lord's church was established on the first Pentecost day, a Jewish feast day, after the Lord had arisen from the dead and ascended back to heaven. And that's recorded in Acts chapter 2. On that day, the apostles preached the truth of the gospel in its fullness. And a great crowd of people heard and understood and came to believe in Christ. They repented of their sins as they were instructed in Acts 2 verse 38 and were baptized for the remission of those sins. The Bible teaches in that same chapter, Luke writes, that they, by the Lord himself, were added to the church. Now concerning them, Luke had this to write, that they were steadfastly continuing in the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and prayers. Now that's the American Standard Version, 1901. I want you to consider with me what is said in Acts 2 and this passage, verse 42, in the King James Version. And they continued steadfastly the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. If you notice the difference in the translations, you will notice that the American Standard, and there are other versions that do the same thing, says they were steadfastly continuing That is a more literal translation of the Greek than is really conveyed, although the truth is conveyed, in verse 42 of the King James Version, and they continue steadfastly. The idea, the expression of the expression were steadfastly continuing gives you the idea that this was a steady course of action on their part. It's part of their life now that they're Christians. It's what they did with reference to the items mentioned in this matter of fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. Now notice the word fellowship. The Greek word is koinonia. And it's a very comprehensive term. And guess what? It can embrace the idea of contribution. I know that <clears throat> because I look over in Romans 15, 26. You can write that down if you want to. 2 Corinthians 8, 4. And 2 Corinthians 9, 13. And Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. And there it's applied in that way in the subjects under consideration. 2 Corinthians 8, 4 and chapter 9, 13 is directly involved with contribution, financial matters. 
The idea was that there was, from the very beginning, in continuing the apostles' doctrine, in view of all the Lord taught about Christians being concerned about those less blessed than themselves, there was always charitable contributions. Remember, James will tell us that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the widows and orphans in their afflictions and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's pure and undefiled religion. Each Christian can practice it, and the church collectively can practice it. It would be hard to realize in all that the word fellowship has to bring to our minds regarding the relationship between brothers and sisters in the family of God, that there wasn't that concern. And we see as we go on through Acts that there was a daily distribution of things that had been contributed to the widows. We under, we would, if we understood better the situation of widows and orphans at that time, it would be not like today. There was nobody to help those folks but family and religion, period. There were many widows who were quite young with smaller children because a man did well to live to be 35 in those days. Paul will speak of himself later on, and he would have been somewhere in his 50s as Paul the aged. And it's only been in recent years due to nutrition, and medical advancements, and I speak even as late as 1900 to where the average age of the American male was 47. I remember my grandmother talking about when she was a little girl, and this would have been well over 100 years ago, not when she was talking about it, but when she was telling about it in her lifetime, of how she looked at people in those days, and she thought of those men, and some of them so old, and had walking sticks, and some of them had long beards and so forth. And she realized when she grew up and thought about it, those people were just in their 50s, but yet they're much older. It's only in very recent times that, I mean the last 50 years or less, that people have begun to live with some good feelings health-wise beyond 65 and 70. There's a reason that Social Security in the 1930s was set at 65. That's because they knew most people wouldn't live to be that old. Well, now look at it. But in those days, there were lots of widows and lots of orphans, and there was no federal government printing money to hand out to them or all sorts of other welfare projects. And the church, when it came together, because they were brothers and sisters in God's family, redeemed of Christ, all believed and obeyed the same gospel, they were helping each other. Implication with what? Well, they had money then, like they have money now. And when you read a little further over, you'll see that they actually... To meet the needs, people who had extra turned it into cash, if you want to call it that, so they could help. My point is, from the very beginning, the Lord taught these things. But even the law of Moses to the Jew, if they were faithful, practiced these things. Some people say, well, the Jews only had to give 10% of their income. You've never really studied the Old Testament if you think that's all they gave, if they were faithful to God. If you study all the free will offerings and all such things that they could give, you'll see they gave up to a third of what they had. And they never knew anything about the church and the gospel and the New Testament. The word koinonia is used specifically by the Apostle Paul regarding even the support of gospel preachers in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 6. The point is, is that when we speak of fellowship, when we speak of this sharing together as brothers and sisters in Christ, there is a work to do. 
the Lord is at the right hand of God, the head of the church, ruling through the New Testament, the, the people of this kingdom. And we're expected to carry on what he says must be done if souls would be saved. First of all, preach the gospel to every creature. Then the many things that we would do in the idea of practicing pure and undefiled religion. So along with this teaching here in Acts 2 and verse 42 concerning the Lord's Supper and prayer, I think we can safely say that there's a very strong, at least circumstantial evidence that regular giving predated the Corinthian epistle written many years later, possibly as much as 25 years. Giving was a part of the spiritual fiber of a converted person who was a Christian. How do I know that? Number one, to be converted means you've given your whole self to God. Now, if you give your whole self to God, everything you've got is given to God. Sometimes it's uh, jokingly told, but it makes a good and important point that this person was being baptized to Christ. And just before the preacher was going to baptize him, he said, wait, 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 wait a minute. He took out his billfold and laid it on the side. I don't want that baptized. <laughs> Brethren, none of us, old or young, male or female, none of us can serve God with reservations. You can't reserve anything for yourself. Say, I'll give 90% to God. I'll give 99.999% to God, but there's that other point, <laughs> a percentage I'll keep for myself. He won't accept it. It's all or none. Now, a converted person, as the Bible defines conversion to Christ, knows that. Paul, and we may have cause to go into that more later, in writing in the second epistle to the Corinthians, in chapters 8 and 9, makes it clear that the Macedonians gave far more than what he expected in the guild. Likely it was little in compared to what the Corinthians could give because they were a very rich part of the country. And they surprised Paul. Now, I, I think that's something to say who was surprised and why it was surprised that they gave as much as they did. But he tells them why. He's writing that to the Corinthians to use them as an example of why they should give as the Macedonians should give them. He said they first gave themselves. We would solve not just the giving problem in the church amongst us, but we would solve every problem in the church amongst us if we really were converted to Christ and we had given ourselves wholly and completely without reservation to seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew 6, 33. Now it's important to understand that you don't have a lot said about the time to give as far as the church collectively gives for some time. I think there's a reason for that. We call this time in the first century concerning the church the infant stage of the church because the New Testament was given part and parcel, not just all dumped out overnight as we have it in our Bibles today. The apostles spake only as the Holy Spirit guided them to speak. And the whole truth of God was revealed as God saw fit through the apostles. So the church knew that. And Luke records they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. So it's important to realize that every as not every aspect of church polity was fully and formally in place on the day that it came into existence. But to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins meant that one had said, I give my all and all to God. Everything I have and am belongs to Him. And then as these things developed through revelation of the Spirit to the apostles, they would understand. Remember, it took quite a while, and we don't know exactly how long, for the Jews to recognize that uncircumcised Gentile had a right to the gospel of Christ. 
just like they did. And you have to go over to Acts 10, and then where Peter recounts the matter in chapter 11, to see how God caused them to say, yes, the uncircumcised Gentile has the right to the gospel. You might notice that Luke doesn't even mention elders in the church. So you get to Acts 11 and verse 30. And if you think for a minute, if you've got the apostles with the power they had from God for the purpose God set them in the church, then they would keep things going as they ought to go. And we learn from Peter's own pen that he not only was an apostle, but he wasn't appointed an elder. J.W. McGarvey in his new commentary on Acts pointed out that Luke wrote his record, and here's what he had to say. After, I'm quoting here now, after the churches had been fully organized and all the officials and their duties had become well known. Now that's commentary, but I think it's implied as you look at the record, the divine record, of the development of the church. It's important to understand that some elements of New Testament doctrine were incrementally placed in the infant church. That's the way God did it. If you read 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul said, now we know in part, prophesy in part. Well, that means it came part and parcel. The whole of what we have in the New Testament wasn't dumped out on them all at once. So we see then how revelation came in what we call that infant stage of the church when they did not have a completely revealed and written down New Testament. So the truth was on this earth before it was written down. Now don't ask me the time all that happened. I can just say in the first century when the New Testament was being revealed and confirmed by miracle signs and wonders that it was from God and not from man. And then time was written down. Now we turn to our passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Of course, this is written to the church in Corinth. And he says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, I have given order to the churches of Galatia, as I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. The American Standard Version reads this way. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I gave order to the churches of Galatia, so also do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by him in store, as he may prosper, that no collections be made when I come. Now there's something here I want to emphasize. We may mention it again as we go through this. And I don't understand to this day why it's this way. Because I recognize that the King James Version, the American Standard Version, certainly sets out accurately the truth of God for anybody that would be saved doesn't mean they're the only ones but it means those are ones especially the King James that we're used to there's the new King James and there's different revisions of it by the way but what I've never understood because I know a little bit about the Greek documents from whence they translated and by the way the King James, they relied on one type of document. Well, we'll go into that now. And the American Standard, they relied on another Greek document. But nevertheless, they read about the same way. I've never understood why. Because it reads as plainly as it can read that way in the Greek. It says every first day of the week. And neither the King James nor the American Standard has every. I don't understand that. 
Now, I can show you it is every first day of the week without it explicitly using the word every first day of the week because it's the first day of the week and every week, and when it rolls around, here's what you're to do regarding contributing. So I can do that. I have no problem with it, and that's what brethren have done for years. But I wish somebody out of all those right scholars that put together both of these versions hundreds of years apart, but nevertheless they did, why they chose to do that. I've never read anything nor heard anybody tell me about anything as to why they didn't do that. Because it's in the Greek, period. So here's New Testament authority for giving. And I pointed out to you already the circumstantial evidence that it was the spirit of the Christian to give. Can't give what you don't have. The spirit of the Christian to take care of the widows and orphans and other people who needed help could not provide for themselves, to supply for the support of preachers of the gospel and so on. I know that was there, but you don't have, that's kind of general. But since the apostle here in 1 Corinthians, where he writes these two verses, was answering questions submitted to him by these brethren, that we need to realize he's answering questions. Now, they likely could not ask those questions if they did not have some knowledge of the giving that they were doing. Sometimes we fail to see the context of these things because we missed it back in 1 Corinthians 7, 1, where Paul just plainly says, now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. That tells me he's switching and he's going to deal with what they wrote to him. And I have to keep it in that context. He's answering questions. And if you will notice, every time he changes to another question, he says, now concerning. 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Chapter 8 and verse 1, he says, now concerning. And chapter 12 and verse 1, he says, now concerning. Well, in Hebrews, uh, or rather in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 16, notice how he begins that. Now, concerning. I'm answering that question. Whatever it was they put to him, he's answering it. We try to form the questions out of the answers that he gave, but he didn't write down, here's what you wrote, now let me answer that question. So they had to have known something about church contributions in the local treasury already. But they needed some clarification. Well, I know that's been part of the whole letter is that Paul was dealing with problems in the church and answering their questions. Well, you ask a question, you get clarification. Get the answer or clarification further more. This is where one of the first rules of biblical interpretation comes in. Common sense is the way things work. And how could they ask the question if they didn't know something about it? So the passage suggests that systematic giving for the support of the work of the Lord's church was already known. And we've already seen the background of it back in the days of the Lord's ministry on earth and there in Acts chapter 2. They took this work seriously. It was part of going to heaven. The term order simply denotes a command. He's not merely urging that people do this. It's not an option. I can or don't have to. It is part of being faithful, it is part of obligation of the Christian. It's not say, well, I'll just kind of toss in whatever my hand gets when the plate comes by. It's not that, that idea. The idea is I, I've got to be serious about this. Remove giving. Let me say this and listen. Remove giving from Christianity and you destroy it. That's all you're going to do. Remove the spirit of charity and concern for others and wanting to help them. 
when they can't help themselves. And you destroy pure and undefiled religion because I know what the Holy Spirit said pure and undefiled religion is. And visit the widows and orphans in King James Version means not just go say, how you doing? It means to supply to them what is orphans. Their parents are normally supply, but nobody's there to do it now. It means widows, when they were husbands, to supply those things to the wives. They're not there. And if they're going to get any help, it's going to have to come from their family. Well, a lot of families won't help. Well, what was the church doing? How concerned were they? Well, you've got the example set early on in the church of helping the widows there in the church to actually sold lands and houses. And it's interesting that in the midst of all that is when you've got the first great sin in the church mentioned, and now Sapphira. Because it's obligatory in nature does not mean it should be a burden. But it should be one of joyous occasion bereft of grumbling and complaining on the part of the givers. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. Write it down and look at it. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Who is the best example of which there is no bester? <laughs> Who is the best example of giving? Why, Jesus Christ. Can't you just see him when he says, well, look what they've done. We made a world specifically for them. It was perfect. We put them in it. They were perfect. And what did they do? They ruined it. Well, the only way you can save them is for you to go down there and be one of them and show you how God would live as a man and overcome sin, though tempted in every point like as they are. Be the Lamb of God and go sacrifice yourself for nothing you did that was wrong, but for them on their behalf and the Lamb of God die on the cross of Calvary. And you can just see him, I don't want to do this. Why not just get away with them? Start over. Well, what about the spiritual body of Christ? When we've been totally converted, as the New Testament defines conversion. When we don't belong to ourselves anymore. We belong to Christ. To do His will. Now, this doesn't just apply to how you determine the cash, if you want to call it that, or the check you write or whatever you drop in the plate. But it has to do with your whole life and involvement in the church. And so this comes up. Several of them have asked it over the years, and I couldn't tell you how many times over the years as a preacher I've said to the congregation, if everybody in this congregation lived their lives for the Lord like you are, where would this congregation be? That's a fair question. Where would the teachers come from? Where would the elders come from, the deacons come from, the preachers come from? You ever ask yourself the question, where do faithful preachers come from? Out from under a cabbage? <laughs> I've seen some of them ought to be under a cabbage, but those are false teachers. Well, where do faithful gospel preachers come from? If it's, if it's not that they grow out of their faith in Christ, then it's come from the wrong place. And the same thing's true of elders, to meet those qualifications, to be appointed, to be deacons in the same way. Where do they come from? They come from the truth of God and their, people, and their willingness to embrace those truths and change their lives to meet those standards. That's exactly what it is. Have you ever noticed that in the qualifications of deacons, it says they're already really doing what a deacon does. And thus, if they meet these qualifications, they can be appointed. How do you prove anything to anybody? Genuinely prove it as to what you are, by the way you live, by the fruits you shall know them. doesn't just apply to whether a fellow is teaching the truth or not. It applies to whether you're faithful or not, whether you're ready for anything. Now, in this connection, it must be emphasized that clearly giving is the only authorized method for financing the work of the church of God. Giving. I say, in every aspect of Christianity, if you remove giving, you destroy it. 
When you became a Christian, you gave yourself to God through Christ by your obedience to the gospel. You said, from here on out, I'm going to do what he wants me to do and the way he wants me to do it for the reason or reasons he wants me to do it. And that's what's called faithful Christian living, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. The church, as an organized body, is not authorized to operate businesses. It's not in the banking business. It's not in the real estate business. It's not to conduct pay-at-the-door concerts or anything else you can think of like that in raising its funds. It raises its funds from its own faithful members who are converted to Christ and all that we've said that means. The church of our Lord, the kingdom of Christ, the family of God is not some sort of commercial enterprise. Of course, there, if there's no pattern for raising church finances, the door is wide open for any moral method of obtaining income. That door is not wide open. We often say, whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. Colossians 3.17 that governs everything there is about us because we've given ourselves to the Lord. And I don't know how to do what the Lord wants me to do if I don't read what He's authorized me to do. Do you know how you figure that out if you don't know the will of Christ concerning your conduct as a Christian? As a man, married as a husband, children as a father, even as a citizen or as a neighbor, or even I treat your enemy. And you can apply that to the woman too. Covers every phase of life. The Christian is to contribute every Sunday. I've already talked about that. Upon the first day of every week is the way it reads. And then the word lay by. I've run across this uh, from time to time. People try to say this was applied only to the Christians at that time for the given purpose they were taking up the money at that time. I said, uh, where did you find that verse? <laughs> Where did you find that verse? I want to show you something. When Paul addressed this letter to the church at Corinth, he didn't just address it to the church at Corinth back about 2,000 years ago. Listen to how he begins this letter. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. And Sosthenes, our brother, Unto the church of God which is at Corinth. That's where it stops, isn't it, in your Bible? No, it doesn't. To them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Now listen, he's going to talk to us. With all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So when I read 1 Corinthians, or the totality of the New Testament message in all its component parts. It's addressed to us. And what he's teaching right here concerning giving means that we're to think ahead of time. The lay by is in the present tense in the Greek language. That means linear action. You just draw a straight line. It doesn't stop, does it? So it's suggesting... Plainly, that it's a regular, ongoing activity. Every week, the Christian is blessed with prosperity. He or she must, notice it's obligatory, give for the support of the Lord's work. One of the things I think parents fail to do Yet it's an obligatory matter upon them as parents and rearing their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Whatever money comes into the hands of those kids, they ought to be taught from the earliest stages to give some of it, whether it's a penny or 10 cents or a nickel or 50 cents or whatever, to the Lord. It ought to be made an habitual part of their life, done for the right reason. Well, why would you do that? 
Because that's the way you just don't teach kids the truth on the matter or any matter pertaining to Christianity. But you train them to do it. Now, if this text provides no evidence that there was a regular contribution before this time, then I don't know how you would determine we ought to worship on every first day of the week routinely and regularly. The Corinthian letter was written before the events of Acts 20 and verse 7, where it says Paul assembled with them to break bread on the first day of the week. They were already doing these things. Furthermore, why would every Sunday be specified if this is just a recommendation? I found out over the years, it's a sad commentary, but either it's a good thing. If you just put it on the area of recommendation, brethren say, well, then I don't have to do it because there's too many brethren not really converted who are looking for a reason to do as little as they can anyway. I want to tell you right now, if that's the attitude of somebody that calls himself a Christian, they're not going to heaven. They're just not going to go to heaven. It's not a hit or miss thing. When you consider what all God did to save us, what do you think he expects out of us? Or what does he mean when he says, take up your cross daily and follow me? What does he mean? What does he mean when he say, says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? For as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. That all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. Ephesians 1 in verse 3. How do you gauge yourself? Now, if you read 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, you have actually their authority to give beyond your normal giving. The Macedonians did. Inspiration records it. And inspiration records it as an example of the Corinthians to give the same way out of what they have and as they've prospered that the Macedonians did. In effect, Paul could have said, you Corinthians who are very wealthy, surprise me with your contribution like the Macedonians who are very poor surprise me with theirs. Because you promised a year ago, he says, and that to make the contribution, you haven't done it. I sometimes jokingly say, a little element of truth to it, well, I know they're my brethren. They promised a year ago and they're still talking about doing it, but, you know, the old, Round to it. You ever receive a round to it? Wonder why those things were ever made. People can decide to do things that are wholesome and good and right and ought to be done. And six months later, they'll say we ought to do it. And a year goes by and we ought to do it. We ought to do it. Yeah, that's fine. We sure need to do that. But the problem is, it's like announcements. They're announced, and as soon as the closing prayer is made and they disperse, they've forgotten what was in the announcements. It can happen that way with anything, in the home, in the plans, and purposing. How many plans are people going to make here in about a month? New Year's resolution. How many of them it won't last a day, hardly, might last a month at the very best. Why can't they make those resolutions when they need to be made and then put forth the willpower and many times the sacrifices to make them? Certainly the specific use of this collection involved relief of the destitute among the saints in Jerusalem. Paul talks about that over in the Roman letter in Romans 15 verse 26. That's just the occasion whereby God used these things to teach us the way the church raises finances. The underlying principle of the passage then serves as a precedent for the manner in which the church is to gather financial resources for the implementation of any divinely authorized work. I've got more I want to say about this, but we'll do that later. 
Let me just simply say, where do you think the finances come from for the church to do anything? Where do you think it comes from? Where does now, let's ask it this way, where does God expect it to come from? And from just this brief study, and this is not new, you know, to the church. shouldn't be anyway. Who is God obligating to provide those finances? To get the greatest work that can be done on earth done in all of its particulars. I preached a lesson like this a long time ago, crowding 50 years ago. Had more in it than this, but I was talking about sacrificing things. Sacrifice, what is it? Gives up something important to you and you need it. And there were two elderly brethren who never missed an opportunity to be contentious. Born in the objective mood and the, or is it the other way around? Well, they had the objective mood. I forgot what the case is. But it went right along with the objective move. <laughs> they never missed a case. So I heard them as they came out the door and stood out there after I preached that sermon. One put his hands in his pockets and smiled. The other said, you're going to sell your boat and give the money to church? <laughs> well, they're dead now. I hope they repented. But that's the way brethren think. These folks have been members of church for years and years and years and years. At that time, I was about 27 probably. And they were up in their 60s. In fact, one died before I left there. People have missed it. We don't know what conversion is. Or it's the old favorite. Somebody else take care of it. But who is that somebody else? And how do you think that's going to work on the day of judgment? When you stand peering into the eyes of he who died for you. And say, well, I knew it was a good thing. But I thought so-and-so would take care of it. So-and-so would take care of it. Well, the sad part about it is that long before apostasy has eaten into the church like it has to this present day over the last 50 years, for those who seemingly knew and traveled among the churches more than certain others, they would tell you then that it probably came in each congregation whether they numbered 500 or 50 to about 40%, if that many, of the church really doing the work of that congregation. So we need to think about this, what it means to be converted. That Christianity is a giving thing. And it means we give our all in all and we can't serve God with reservations. And that we each one personally must stand before Jesus to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. There's no escaping that. And that we should understand what it is to be dedicated solely and completely to Jesus Christ, acting only as he's authorized us to act. If you're not a child of God this morning, we hope we've emphasized one thing that will help you, and that is if you become a Christian, you become a Christian. You're converted totally, completely dedicated to God. And from here on out, that's it, repentance. You're turning away from self and turning to doing God's will. You need to believe in Christ, repent of your sins then, and confess your faith in Christ and be buried with your Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. As a child of God, I hope this helps us review honestly what's involved in being a Christian in this one signal and important area of the church getting the work done God expects it to do and that it's obligatory. Yet it's a joyous occasion to be counted worthy to be able to give. You're a person out in the world they can give all they want. It doesn't matter. He's not converted to Christ or she's not. They're still in their sins, a separate from God. But not so with members of the church. He's our Heavenly Father. We're brothers and sisters in the family of God. Very special to God. And so we should act like it because we want to. It's the thing to do. It's the way that's right and cannot be wrong. If we need to repent of sins, then repent of them. 
Confess them and pray, God, forgiveness. Whatever your need is in those areas, if you need now, we ask you to come while we stand and sing.